Good afternoon and welcome to the first of the textual discussions on Robinson Crusoe. Now, in our experience as professors, we've looked at a wide variety of students and we find that very often many of you do not even bother to read up the text. So I've designated or designed three lectures here, which will take a look at the text proper. And the intention is to familiarize you with passages from the text so that you get a sprinkling of the kind of narrative style that Tico uses and the themes and issues that he brings up within these, this particular novel. So here goes. This is titled the first lecture, as it were. And I would like to share my text with you. My screen, rather. Here goes. And here is the word version. Now, <coughs> Robinson Crusoe, incidentally, begins with the family settled in Hull. They are de derived from probably a Dutch variant of the name Kruetsnezer, of which you know Crusoe becomes a kind of an important part. Now, very interestingly, see this entire idea of Crusoe, suffering, cross, etc., has strong Christian parallels. And the entire biblical structure of the novel is very clear from the beginning. And the first thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is the father's advice to Robinson Crusoe. Now, his father, when Crusoe suggests that he will <clears throat> sort of go to sea, his father is vehemently opposed to it and advises him that the calamities of life, as you can find out in that quote, were shared among the upper and lower part of mankind, but that the middle station had the fewest disasters and was not exposed as the higher or the lower parts of mankind. Now, obviously, the Crusoe family be belongs to the merchant class. And as professionals, they enjoy reasonable uh, social position and wealth and prosperity. And as we have shown in the lecture on the English tradesmen, we've seen how Defoe casts this group of people as heroes. <coughs> and Crusoe's father's idea is that this is a self-sufficient position which needs not to be disturbed, which ensures profit, which ensures a reasonable amount of prosperity, and that it can be improved sensibly, tasting the sweets of living, so enjoying the fruits of their labor, feeling that they are happy and learning by every day's experience. So it's a gradual evolution of the self within a static position that the father is advocating. Now, this obviously Crusoe sort of defies. And he recurrently talks about in the novel about the breach of my duty to God and my father. Now, later on in the novel, I'm sort of bringing this quote forward. He refers to this breach of duty, a filial duty, as it were, as his original sin. And he talks about the defiance not to look back upon my primitive condition and the excellent advice of my father, the opposition to which so defiance of the word of the father is what he considers to be the original sin. The word of the father being that he should remain within his station and not look for further adventures. And, Defoe say, and Crusoe says that he's a memento. 
So he recurrently throws caution to the winds, takes off from his designated station, which he has created, and plunges into the unknown, marked by an intense wanderlust, as it were. Now, interestingly, Crusoe suggests that this is the pattern of his life and that he will not violate, or rather he will violate the word of the father and commit original sins one after the other. Now, interestingly, you can see that this entire rhetoric is borrowed from a biblical parallel, that of Adam defying the word of the father of the filial God and thereby being cast off from paradise. Now, it's interesting the way that Robinson Crusoe will soon be cast off from the paradise that is England. He will be sold as a slave to the Moors. He will spend two years in slavery, go off to Brazil and become a plantation owner there, throw off that paradise also, and enter, as it were, the dystopia of the island, which is completely silent and lonely. So apparently, it has a biblical structure of Crusoe as the modern Adam, defying his filial God, the father, and cast off from the English paradise into a South Pacific island dystopia marked by loneliness and despair. This is what the pattern seems to be like. So that is where the original sin becomes a crucial entry point into the novel. But as I will later on argue, that the original sin is in many ways at the heart of both colonialism and narrative. As long as Crusoe remains on the mainland <coughs> and does not go exploring with his wanderlust to the colonies, there can be no colonialism. There can be no empire. So you see, these figures, Christopher Columbus, Marco Polo, be they, you know, Captain Cook, be they notorious characters with their greed, avarice, their violence, yet by violating the original sin of remaining within their station, they remain the forefathers of the colonial enterprise. So the original sin in that sense is not an original sin for colonialism at all. That we can suggest right at the beginning that there are two discourses which are at play here. The first is the traditional Christian discourse, which will then lead on to the spiritual autobiography structure of Robinson Crusoe, that man has a fall, he makes an error of judgment, and then has a fall, has to undergo suffering within suffering, realizes the power of God, realizes providence's way of working. And finally, through this realization, attains penance and salvation. So Crusoe's original sin, his shipwreck, his suffering, his deliverance from the island, and his return to the English utopia is, as it were, one structure of the narrative. But is it the most dominant structure of the narrative? No. Do we read this novel for its Christian component? We do not. Because <laughs> the Christian narrative is held in taut tension by the narrative of adventure, the narrative of border crossings, the narrative of continuous 
aggression into territory, colonization of territory, and consolidation on the island. So Crusoe, in that narrative of colonialism, moves from one utopia, but manages to create another utopia on a strange location. Therefore, we can suggest that these two narratives, one of exploration and the other of Christianity, one of stasis, one of urgent and ceaseless movement forward, like Ulysses drinking life to the lees. I cannot rest from travel. As Ulysses says, such is the spirit of deep. So the original sin is an extremely complicated concept in Robinson Crusoe. In many ways, it is a Christian concept which is given an entirely new dimension and questioning by Tiff. Now, let me then once again move away from this one particular topic and take a look at how you know Crusoe's first adventure. And remember, you'll have to remember that there is a significant amount of Robinson Crusoe before the shipwreck. So what happens to Crusoe? He travels on a ship, which the pirates take over, is sold as a slave to the captain of a ship, and resides in Morocco. And he escapes from that place with the help of a boy called Zug, whom we will come to by the by. Now, this concept of slavery, this state of slavery, you must remember at this point of time was a very common phenomenon. And very often, Europeans would also be sold as slaves. Now, it's interesting in the sense that Robinson Crusoe and Defoe, by default, participate in this entire discourse without any self-consciousness, as it were. So, Defoe, so Crusoe has no, really no great regret at being a slave, and he does not regret taking a slave. So, slavery, if you take a very careful look at it, is seen within Robinson Crusoe as something which is entirely, you know, compatible within the colonial universe of global trade at this point of time. So, when Crusoe is a lucky slave, it's not dreadful as I apprehended, and is kept by the captain of the rover as his proper prize. And therefore, he then plans to escape from this particular place. So he takes the help of a boy called Zuri, steals a boat with provisions, and launches out onto the sea, and is rescued by an honest captain, who then conveys him to Brazil, where he becomes a plantation owner. But I'm not interested in that plantation owner bit of Robinson Crusoe. What I'm interested in is the way in which he treats this boy, Zuri, and how the captain wants to buy Zuri. And Defoe, who's taken such great favors from him. In fact, there's this episode where Zuri and Crusoe actually sort of fight a leopard. And he has no, and, and a lion. And he has no compunctions in selling off the boy Zuri. And you can notice how underwhelming the narrative is. This is a very mundane kind of a language. So the moment does not matter to Crusoe at all. In fact, if you take a look at Robinson Crusoe very carefully, you will find that Robinson Crusoe is almost entirely devoid of any great literary flourishes. It is almost a matter of fact reportage, be it with Friday, be it with, uh, <clears throat> with Zuri. And therefore, this transactional element that Crusoe brings into his narrative 
of just merely transferring a human asset from one individual to the other reflects this you know discourse within the contemporary global scenario of selling off and trafficking human beings from one place to the other and obviously you can see that zuri will be you know made free in 10 years time if he becomes a christian so in a certain sense you will find that there are two parallel discourses here one is the discourse of trade commerce exploration which is marked by the presence of money self interest and so on and so forth the other is the discourse of christianity and it spread across the globe and notice how you know these two discourses are coming together in the missionary project of making the indigenous people christians of turning them into christians so when we look at you know robinson crusoe as one of the forerunners of the colonial sort of discourse we must understand that you know religion is as important as territory in robinson crusoe and therefore the various shades and dimensions of of the colonial moment is as it were articulated and captured and represented by robinson crusoe right so this is where he sort of is now a plantation owner he has arrived at brazil he's built up quite an estate but then he chucks it all up i hurried on and obeyed blindly the dictates of my fancy rather than my reason so the original sin once again the fancy rather than the reason so is marked by this intense wanderlust which forces him to move from one territory to the other but i choose this passage to give you an idea of what the time frame would have been like 1659 september it is that period that he embarks on his travel on his ill-fated travel as it were where he lands up in on the island now <clears throat> i will not talk about the shipwreck but you will remember that the ship is stuck at a sand bank and had defo and his fellow sailors remained on the ship they would have probably been saved by the storm but that ship that stuck ship on the sand bank is important because the ship the boat wrecked crusoe will repeatedly go back to that ship and bring back arms and tools which will be very important for his survival but let me look at this moment of being marooned and you can sense that these are passages where defo sort of breathes a degree of interiority within crusoe so that they pulsate with a lot more emotion here and you can sense the the dazed crusoe sort of moving around on the seashore crying about his misfortune at the same time thanking heavens that he's been saved lifting up my hands and my whole being wrapped up in a contemplation of my deliverance making a thousand gestures and motions which i cannot describe it is in these moments that you see the literary and the hyperbolic kind of come together to create intense moments of internal subjectivity they were aiding in the first person narrative but then once again you see comes a very crucial section of the text and this is where he looks at the sea and he finds as for them his fellow sailors i never saw them afterwards or any sign of them except three of their hats one cap and two shoes that were not fellows now ian watt in the discussion of robinson crusoe i'm sorry not on robinson crusoe but on the novel in general talks about one very important feature of the novel <coughs> and that is formal realism in formal realism 
what talks about specific names, places, dates, territories, and he also talks about narrative details that concretize the text, make them in very similitude, give us the illusion of reality. And take a look at that, those casual details that Crusoe has left. Three of their hats, one cap, two shoes. Random details. But if you imagine the kind of waves that are floating around and you have these objects, you can immediately concretize this as reality. So the illusion of reality is created through these small details within the text so that Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, you know, is bulk about reportage, detailing with occasional forays into the interiority of Crusoe. Now, why is Crusoe so very every man like? Is it because we do not see his interior very often? Is it because he becomes largely symbolic? And is it because we see through Crusoe's eyes these small details on the island? So I leave you with these questions to ponder about, you know, the quality of language in Robinson Crusoe. Very often talk about, you know, Defoe's colonialism and so on and so forth. But how he manages the representation is a very important aspect of both the art of Crusoe as well as the history of the development of the English novel. Now let me look at the tools that he has. And you will remember that he sort of sees the ship, takes quick decisions that the ship might flounder any moment and sink. And therefore he needs to extract as many tools as he can as possible. Now, when he's looked at the territory, he's looked at a barren landscape, he's looked at the absence of wild beasts. He still does not know what exists on the island. You know, you'll have to remember that first shot that he fires, killing a bird, which is actually a bird of prey, he cannot eat it. But that one shot immediately on that island, which has never seen such a sound, releases all the natural animals. And he can see, you know, flocks of birds. He can see even a few animals scurrying away. So it's that moment when he has the tool and he creates this sound. He sort of announces his arrival. That shot is the announcement of the arrival of man on the island. So that the island now becomes a, a belongs to the human. And she said the sense of possession of the self as well as of the territory is something that is very critical to Robinson Crusoe. You know, it's not only a text about adventure, discovery, narrative, it's also a text about possessing all that his surveys. And for that, the tools remain imperative. So what are the tools that he sort of gets? And what does he bring back from the ship? Bread, rice, cheese, goat's flesh, little remainder of European corn, barley and wheat, wheat together, which he incidentally brings back because this will be the basis on which the seeds will sprout. So, very importantly, the remnants of European soil, which will be carried by Defo and poured on the South Pacific, so that that becomes then a replica of the European soil and produce. Now, there is liquor, for example, which he takes. And then he comes away and his clothes are sort of washed away. Now, this aspect of clothing is also very interesting. 
You know, in that barren island, really, clothing does not matter to Robinson Crusoe apart from covering his skin. But notice the, the kind of detailing that Crusoe will later on add to the clothing. So clothing is seen as civilization. Clothing is the fact that sets him out from the barbarian. And yet, paradoxically, it makes him, you know, stand out as a kind of an exhibit, his peculiar, you know, sheepskin clothing, as it were. So it is, as it were, the clothing fixes our gaze on the strange and surprising Robinson Crusoe. And at the same time, it is the clothing which announces his separation of segregation from the indigenous tribes who have really no clothing on them. So this fascination with clothes is something which Defoe brings to the narrative. And then comes the very important part. So he goes back next day for ammunition and arms. So two very good fowling pieces, muskets as it were, two pistols, powder horns, small bag of shot, rusty old shorts. So metal guns. It's this image of Crusoe with the phallic gun on his shoulder. If you remember that the, the thumbnail that I have uploaded, you know, two guns protruding out from the back of Defoe. No, I'm sorry, Crusoe. It's that phallic gun which makes him more powerful on this island. It's that phallic European gun which gives him power over both the animal and the human on that island. It is what makes him the conqueror. So the small detail which, you know, Crusoe almost flits across is a most significant moment. It is when he finds that gun that he becomes superior. And you see, the difference with Selkirk's experience is that, you know, Defoe is giving Crusoe the resources with which he can create a longer stay on the island so that the empire can be built. And you will see how, you know, these rusty swords and the muskets and the pistols become gateways for reading how empire, you know, sort of controls the colony in the sense that, you know, very peaceful colonial people were overrun by the weapons of the Europeans. Right, so he has powder and thereby this remains one of the most crucial finds of Crusoe on the ship. And then he brings back also, very interestingly, if arms are his mode of dominating the territory, then the mode of, you know, redesigning the territory depends on the carpenter chest that he comes back. Two or three bags full of nails and spikes, screw jack, hatchets, and a grindstone. Now, you see, within this secular structure of power, and discourse of power and dominion, these are things that stand out, that carpenter's chest and the gums. One ensures that he can dominate the territory. The other ensures that he can create and refashion the territory. So these are two very important elements that he sort of carries back. He takes back the men's clothes, a hammock, some bedding, four topsail, and he brings them on the shore with very great comfort. But there is an interesting passage here because Crusoe then finds some money, a chest full of coins, some European coins, some Brazil, some pieces of eight, some gold, some silver. And then comes this very interesting passage because on this island, you know, gold or bullion or money has no value because after all, money is a system of exchange. If you have nobody to exchange it with, 
it does not matter. And notice the kind of dismissal of money that Crusoe has. Oh, drug, said I, what art thou art good for? Thou art not worth to me. One of those knives is worth all this heap. I have no manner of use for thee. Now, therefore, it seems that, you know, Robinson Crusoe on the island is, this is something which many people have pointed out, that it cannot be an example of capitalism because, you know, there is no transactional value within the island. But notice what Crusoe does immediately. Having said all this, however, upon second thoughts, I took it away. So always there is this possibility. And if you remember that project of Defoe, that he would establish a kind of a colony, a kind of, he would establish domination over a particular island. And from there, he would sort of move into trade and commerce. You can understand why. You know, getting hold of the territory is important. Securing it is important. After this, as an afterthought, you know, the money will come into play later on. So these smaller details within the text, you know, create anecdotal moments. But these moments conceive what the novel is later on going to be about. Right, so that is fundamentally the kind of text that I wanted to talk to you about. This is where the first part of the novel, as it were, ends. Defoe has been shipwrecked, I'm sorry, Crusoe, has been marooned. The ship has sunk, the boat has sunk. He's now on the island with a dog, some kittens, and he will later on tame a few animals. He has tools to his credit. He has gadgets also, a carpenter's chest, and he has human labor. So right at this point of time, you see, he has a territory. He has guns. He has a carpenter chest. And he has a labor of his own with which he can completely transform this supposedly island dystopia into an island paradise. Now. To go back to that question about the original sin, why is it so problematic? Because it is paradoxical. It is paradoxical because if there is no original sin and if there is no shipwreck and journey, then Crusoe does not arrive on the island. He cannot conquer it. And then the story of European colonization can never occur. So. You see, the figures like Captain Cook or, for that matter, Christopher Columbus who were really dubious personalities in the sense they were pirates at home. Yet they were feted because of their wanderlust, their thirst for adventure and the fact that they brought back narratives detailing territory and wealth. So in Defoe's text, what is the original sin in the Christian sense of the term is actually the originary moment of colonialism. And therefore, this impulse of wanderlust for the colonial encounter is a vital ingredient. Now, the question remains as to how this original sin can be, you know, wedded or welded to the concept of this colonial benefit. So it is in the deepening of the colonizer's Christian impulse. Now, it's very problematic. Why? Because you see, on the one hand, Crusoe is a very violent man. And there are no compunctions absolutely in the way in which he kills so many people there. At the same time, there are religious revelations within Robinson Crusoe to him about the providence. So in a certain sense, 
Crusoe is providing the narrative of colonization with a kind of a providential bias. That he was meant to be there, that he was meant to be an agent through which Friday's reform could take place and through which he could be sort of uplifted from the state of cannibalism. Therefore, this great idea of the colonizer's burden, as it were, is first borne by Crusoe and then transferred to Friday. The colonizer has to undergo the pain of isolation, the pain of segregation from the mainland. And within that, by sublimating that pain and conquering territory and the colonized, he can then transfer that Christian pain into the spread of Christianity. So Defoe's text is about departures and arrivals, utopias and dystopias. In the original sin, Adam is cast out of paradise. Defoe's original sin sees him cast out of paradisical England, only to arrive at a colonized uh, dystopia as a colony and then transform it into his own utopia of a mini England. So the original sin is not really an original sin at all. It remains at the heart of the narrative. Now also, you need to take a careful look at the narrative also. If Crusoe stayed at home, became old and traded, would there have been any narrative at all? No. Even for the narrative, that original moment is the originary moment of the narrative from which the adventure, from which the experience of the narrative and the pleasure of the narrative derives. So when Crusoe uses the term original sin, it can dovetail with the spiritual autobiography and its structure. But there's much more to Robinson Crusoe. The delight in labor, the delight in the colonial moment, the delight in empire building and consolidation of it far outstrips any real agony about the original sin. Also, we need to see how these discourses of colonialism, capitalism, operate simultaneously with the Christian <coughs> rhetoric. And in the final analysis, they seem to overlap with each other rather than confront each other. By the end of the novel, Gifu no longer talks about his original sin at all, because that original sin is what is driving England forwards with their arms, with their tools, into unknown islands waiting to be colonized. In our next lecture, we will take a look at Defoe's Christian anxieties. We'll take a look at the footprint episode and the intensity associated with it and why Crusoe is so afraid. And we'll also take a look at this moment when those grains of barley and corn will yield sprouts and the joy that Crusoe feels and the way in which he will transform their survival into surplus on the island. And it is with this promise then carefully looking at passages within the text and bringing you close readings that I'd like to stop sharing and like to come back to today's class and bring it to an end. I thank you for watching this and I, <coughs> and I hope that many of you will turn up 
when I discuss the second part of the novel tomorrow. Incidentally, there's a short video which I've made on Defoe's original sin, asking the question, what was Defoe's original sin? It's been my experience that, you know, in Google Meet, students would log in. I don't know how many of them will actually listen. But probably longer YouTube lectures are listened to only when the exams come near. But for students who want a very encapsulated form, shorter version of these lectures, looking at important themes, shorter videos might suffice for them. So I am embellishing the larger video, which more serious students can look at with shorter videos, which, you know, people who want to satisfy their curiosity immediately can take a look at. Thank you again for watching and look forward to seeing you tomorrow once again. Thank you very much.